Now to today's session. I am going to introduce our panelists and they will each give a brief presentation. Following the presentations, we will have time for questions, which you can submit via the Q&A function. I am delighted to now introduce our panelists. David King is Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and Faculty Chair of the Senior Executives in State and Local Government Leading Resilient Communities Executive Education Program. Julie Boatwright Wilson is the Harry Kahn Senior Lecturer in Social Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and Faculty Co-Chair of the Leading Successful Programs Using Evidence to Assess Effectiveness Executive Education Program. Mark Fagan is Lecturer in Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and faculty chair of the executive education program delivering public services, efficiency, equity, and quality. Finally, my name is Taylor Woods Gothier and I am a program director in executive education at the Harvard Kennedy School. We'll be moderating and we'll also give you a general overview of executive education at the end. David King will be our first panelist this morning. Over to you, David. Wow, thank you so much, Taylor, and welcome everybody who's out there um, watching this little overview of some of the state and local programming that we have through the executive ed program. And it's especially good for me today to be sharing our time with the great and good Julie Wilson, the amazing Mark Fagan. Taylor, you're wonderful. And if you all look at Mark and Julie uh, and what their careers have looked like, it gives you a good sense for what a place like the Kennedy School can offer you. Not, there is no other place other than the Kennedy School where you can get that kind of combination of deep academic analytical rigor and people who worked in the real world. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not people kind of off on some interesting theoretical jag or people who are just trying to, you know, repeat uh, some successes that they had in the world of practice. Uh, it, in Mark and in Julie and in really the faculty generally at the uh, executive ed programs, these are folks who bring theory and practice and keep it very much alive. So it's a real honor to meet all of you and be with uh, my great colleagues. Um, so state and local programs in the United States, what I'll be talking about the uh, senior leaders in state and local government program. There are a couple of versions of it. There's an online version, which is Leading Resilient Communities, that's two weeks long. And there is a three week long in-person program at the Kennedy School. There's some overlap between both of these approach, both of the um, approaches, although the online program is more targeted to specific policy challenges that we're facing right now, post COVID. Uh, in an environment, if you imagine sort of what it's like to breathe with very little oxygen in an environment, uh, economically, financially, that's where we are in state and local government as well. Um, how large is the state and local sector? Um, just on the elected side, we have over a half a million people who hold elective office in the United States. Um, and in a two year period, we have more than 2 million people whose names appear on a ballot for elective office in the United States. It's a massively large segment. And as you know, so many of the important things that are done in public policy happen primarily at a very local level or state or county level. So the Building Resilient and Leading Resilient Communities Program is um, focused on the complexity and interconnectedness of uh, local governments and the federal government. What do we need for resiliency? Well, in some cases, certainly redundance. American political systems are very, by their very design, redundant, but not terribly efficient. How do you work within that? The other thing that we all need is connection not just connections in terms of the institutions that we hold dear, but the connections among individuals. Um, when people talk about political institutions, it's not helpful to simply end there with descriptions of organization charts, because you in state and local government, you are an individual 
nested within inside institutions. And so we work in all of our programs to honor who you are as an individual, what your skills are, how you can grow as an individual, and how you can reach out to people in other institutions. So the resiliency involves redundancy across institutions and connections both personally and interpersonally um, that you develop through the program. One of the things that I teach at the Kennedy School is about the US Congress and legislatures generally. And there's a standard interview question for a job on Capitol Hill. And you can just imagine somebody sitting down for a job interview and they're really tired. And the question that they get is this one, do you get it? And if you as the interview subject say, get what? And you haven't gotten the job. Do you get it? If you come to one of these programs, you'll get it. You'll understand the complexity of these systems. You'll understand the connections in these systems. And you'll answer, oh my goodness, do I get it? And I'm ready for the challenge. Okay, I'll spend just a moment on this specific program for leaders in state and local government. When you apply, you are thrown into a collection of many other students or applicants, and we try and build an ecosystem that will match something like the ecosystem you have back home. Fire, EMS, city managers, electeds. We try and create an ecosystem that you can then experience in person or online and experiment. It's a safe place to experiment. We cover budgeting. The great and good Shelby Chodos is online right now. Um, uh, crisis management, leadership skills and effectiveness. Um, all of the various ways of interacting across agencies, the role of the nonprofits, um, how to work with the private sector, negotiation skills. Um, so all of this is thrown together within the ecosystem on behalf of a project that you bring to us for the Senior Leaders State and Local Government Program. You'll come in with a challenge that you have to deal with sometime over the next three months, usually. And we'll spend our time with you individually and in groups to try and work towards a solution that you can try out in our little ecosystem but when you leave our programs, you leave um, with a completed project that we hope that you'll take out and work on directly. You also leave as part of a community. Um, the senior leaders in state and local government programs have been around since the 1970s. And when you complete our programming, you're part of that alumni group. Um, you're important to us. State and local governments, very important to us. And uh, I'm excited about where we're going together. Taylor, thank you for giving me a few moments. Thank you, David. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentations. Um, for now, I'm gonna turn over to Julie Wilson. Thank you, Taylor. And uh, thank you, David. So I'm gonna start with a story. Um, a number of years ago, I was teaching in David's state and local executive education program. And I asked the class a series of questions. I said, how many of you are getting pressured to produce this? What you're doing is effective. And about three quarters of the hands went up. I then asked how many of you are putting pressure on those you fund or contract with to produce evidence that what they're doing is effective. And about two thirds of the hands went up. I then asked, how many of you feel like you have a really good idea of what constitutes evidence? Mm -hmm. And one lone hand was raised. The class burst out laughing. I couldn't figure out why they were laughing. And finally, someone said to me, that's not fair. He's a judge. It's a different kind of evidence. And that made me realize that we're throwing this term around, evidence and evidence of effectiveness without really knowing what it was, what it is. So I reached out to my colleague, Dan Levy, and we put together a program um, on using evidence. 
And the program um, starts with uh, an acknowledgement that you as a manager are asking a lot of different questions. You're asking things like, how efficient is my organization at actually producing what it is we need to produce? You're also asking questions like, how effective are we with those we're serving? Are we really having an impact? These are very different questions. And the COVID epidemic has pushed us to say, are we even doing the things we need to be doing to support people in the way they need support given the changes in the world? So this program begins by laying out a framework for thinking about the various different types of evidence, both evidence for assessing how your program operates, uh, for how you're using funding, all the way through assessing, did we make a difference in the lives of those that um, we were, we were, uh, that were serving? So our goal is that you will come in knowing your own organization, that you will think about this framework for evidence, and you will use that to think about what are the questions I need to be asking and how can I, given the resources of my organization, best address those, uh, those questions, best come up with answers. Likewise, you will be saying, gosh, you know, we serve adolescents. There's a lot of uh, information out there on programs for adolescents. How do I know what works? How do I know what's not working? What of that should we incorporate into our organization? So the idea is not that we're gonna make you a statistician, not that we're gonna convert you to a serious, hardcore, tenured faculty researcher, but that you'll be able to manage your organization and more effectively use data to, um, to, to run your organization. The other thing I would add is this program is very international. And one of the things we've learned as we've run the program online is that people are saying they're making connections with people all over the world, addressing very similar problems, coming from slightly different or maybe very different perspectives, and they're learning a lot from one another. Um, and they're maintaining those contacts and they're sending back information. Just one more story, and then I'll turn it over to Mark. In laying out our framework, we begin with this idea of question zero. What is your answer to question zero, which is in 10 words or less, what are you trying to accomplish? And one year, one of the students wrote back to the network, and in this case, the network was the full class and said, I gathered my senior managers around the table. I handed each one a three by five card. I told them about the question zero. And I said, you write down your answer to question zero for our organization. And I realized my senior management was not in agreement about what it was we were trying to accomplish. That's step one. You can't know if you're effectively accomplishing it if you don't know what you're trying to do. And so this program is going to get you to go back to the basics, think through what we're doing, how we're doing, how effective that is and what we need to change. And you'll be doing it with peers from around the world. Thank you. And on to Mark. Well, thank you to my colleagues. It's exciting to hear uh, how they portray their programs, which I've had the opportunity to participate in some, and I can assure you are, are really fabulous. I'm really excited to be here as the newbie. Uh, this is a new program we're offering uh, this first go round, and the focus is really on how do we deliver public services? Uh, pretty much everyone in the public sector and many in the nonprofit sphere are responsible for doing this. And the real core that we're trying to focus on is how do we make sure we do that with quality, equity, and efficiency? So let me begin by asking you to think about the last time you were the recipient of a public service. Maybe it was getting your license renewed. Maybe it was registering your child for school. Maybe it was getting a COVID test or vaccine. 
And what I'd like you to do is think back to that experience and do some grading of it in three dimensions, quality, equity, efficiency. From a quality perspective, did you get what you expected and wanted? From an equity perspective, were you treated equally and was everyone else treated equally in the receipt of that service? And then finally, from an efficiency perspective, was it respectful of your time, of the person delivering its time and resources? So think about whether you can say all three of those were A's. Well, I can share with you my own experience, which was a COVID vaccine not too long ago. And I would say I did definitely not get all A's across the board. My hypothesis is that for many of you who thought about the issue that I posed, you too can't really say it was all A's. Now, I wanna make this from a generic to a personal, and the personal is now I want you to think about your own organization. And I want you to think about how you would grade how your own organization delivers public services. Is it an A in terms of quality, efficiency, equity? If you are all A's across the board, I sure hope you'll take the course because we all want to learn from you. But more likely, there were some A's, maybe some B's, maybe a B minus now and again. The goal of this course is to help you move from where you are today to getting straight A's in the way in which your organization delivers. So you may ask the question, well, if this is a new program, what's motivating to do it right now? I've been wanting to do it for a while, in part because the students who take my degree course in this area are always calling me afterwards and telling me, hey, I just used this framework or this tool, it was great, but I wish the rest of my organization had the same exposure that I did. Well, it's hard to do that, uh, but the executive education team said, well, we can probably try and make that happen. But there are really two more important motivators right now. And the first, and it builds on something you heard from David earlier, is the pandemic. The pandemic has created all kinds of new challenges, but also new opportunities in terms of how we deliver public services. We've seen an explosion in telehealth, as an example. We've certainly seen an explosion in online learning. As we head towards whatever the new normal might be, this is a really important time to think about how do I rethink how I deliver public services? The second reason for right now is the focus in this country and not just in the US, but in a number of geographies across the globe, a focus on equity. How do we ensure that everyone receives quality and efficient public services. Given these two motivations, we decided we're going to launch this and start sharing uh, our approach, toolkit, and, and frameworks. In terms of how we go about doing it, uh, we'll begin by making sure you can assess and understand what public value is and how to quantify it. We'll leverage some of the concepts that Julie teaches in her course as well in this course, so that you'll have a good understanding of how do I even estimate public value. A number of us have worked looking at private value. I can assure you of this, spoiler alert, public value is a lot tougher to determine than private value. But we will. Uh, we'll do it looking at TSA as well as automated trash collection, kind of two ends of a spectrum. From there, we'll dive into the question about quality. What is it? What are its attributes? How do we know even in the public sphere, who is the customer? Turns out to be a very challenging question. In this area, we'll be looking at 
understanding how we frame and get our understanding of what is quality. We'll look to understand processes, we'll map them, we'll do some root cause analysis. Uh, for those of you familiar with an Ishikawa diagram or a fishbone, we'll work on those. And more importantly, we'll work towards re-engineering. How do I take a process, identify its gaps, and make it better? From there, we will dive into the issue of equity. And I'll share with you, when it comes to equity, well, it will be a lens we will use as we look at every case. But there are two specific instances where we will really do a deep dive. One of those is in a crisis. And we'll be looking at Memorial Hospital post-Katrina in New Orleans and see how equity played out in that environment. But we'll also take a look and do a simulation on assigning students to schools. It turns out that the trade-offs we have to make really make it challenging to ensure equity. So you'll get your hands dirty a little bit with that. With those two legs of the stool, we'll turn to our third leg, which is efficiency. It's how well do we use the resources? Here we'll be looking at capacity throughput. We'll find the bottleneck. Uh, we'll again, leverage our ideas of re-engineering. We'll do some queuing uh, to help you figure out how to manage lines. We'll think about peaks and how you can mitigate peaks, all with an idea of tying back to quality and equity and using our resources as efficiently as we can. From there, we'll move to talk about technology. Uh, technology has a huge impact on how we deliver services. Obviously, there's an explosion of new technologies associated with the pandemic. We'll be looking at that. But we'll also be looking at how can we use technology to extend the reach of our service delivery. I'll share with you a case uh, that I actually think is an all A's case. Uh, it is M-Pesa, it's mobile money in Kenya, and it is fabulous. We'll see how we can take that uh, and use it internally. Finally, we'll wrap up thinking about change management and performance measurement and management. Uh, you can have the best plans in the world, but if you can't get people to change, it isn't really gonna matter. In doing this uh, along the way, similar to what you heard David talk about in his course, uh, we'll have you bring a challenge that you're facing or your organization is facing right now. And in groups of peers, as well as with me, we'll work through those issues again, so that when you finish the course, hopefully you'll be in a position to actually make a difference in your organization. At the end of the two weeks, in addition to that, you'll have yourself a toolkit and hopefully know how to use all those tools and also how to make your organization at least closer to an all A's organization. I wanna also highlight what both of my colleagues mentioned about the network the opportunity to meet colleagues and leverage their best practices, their insights both in the course and beyond is really a tremendous value add that people have taken from the HKS exec ed programs. Finally, I'll address the question of who ought to be taking this course. Uh, this course is really appropriate if you are responsible for delivering services uh, from education to uh, public safety, to health care, to public works, you name it. If you're delivering a service, this will help you. And even if it's not you directly, if it's people you manage or teams you work with, having this set of skills, I think, can really make a difference for you. Frankly, if you have issues that need resolution, the toolkit will help you in that process. So with that, I'll look forward to seeing you in class and I'll turn it back to Taylor. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, so we picked these three programs to do a deep dive um, in this session, but there are a large suite of programs available that would be of interest to 
a state and local constituency. Um, we've put some of them here on this um, slide. I'm going to just highlight a couple. Um, and then of course there's detailed information on our website and you will receive these slides afterwards with all of these links. Um, but just a couple of things to, to think about that I will highlight. Some of these programs are more technical and look at developing skills and knowledge on specific areas. So for example, our negotiation strategies program is a one week program that makes use of negotiation simulations to teach participants how to achieve consensus and build sustainable agreements among stakeholders that often represent different interests. Both our leadership decision-making and behavioral insights program look at how hidden biases may impact the decision-making process within organizations and how behavioral science insights can be used to construct more effective solutions to public policy problems. Other programs on this list are gonna focus on developing your leadership skills. So for example there, Leadership and Character in Uncertain Times explores adaptive leadership and moral leadership concepts and how to apply those to lead in times of conflict and disagreement. Promoting racial equity in the workplace provides leaders an opportunity to learn about effective strategies for increasing diversity, inclusion, and racial equity within their organizations. So as I said, you can find detailed information on the ones that I just mentioned and everything listed on this slide on our website. On our website, you'll also find each uh, program director's contact information. And you should feel free to reach out directly to the relevant program directors with specific questions about any of these programs. We wanna go to the next slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our kind of general admission and other things you should know about executive education. Um, so all of our admission processes are managed through an online application. You can also find the application on those program sites I mentioned before. And we're looking for information about your current role and really strategic challenges that you're facing and your long-term career goals. All of our programs have a rolling admissions policy. Um, so that means it's better to apply early because um, once we are full, we are full uh, and we do fill up quickly for many of these programs. Once you are admitted and in these programs, you just got some content deep dive, but in terms of your experience, um, all of our programs are gonna have extensive classroom discussion. They'll be quite interactive and that includes our online programs um, and maybe especially our online programs are very interactive. Um, you'll have group work, Mark and David, uh, and I think Julie too all mentioned the kind of small group activities that you'd be doing um, often based on real world problems that you are coming to the program to solve. And you'll also be doing um, case studies in almost every program, which is um, true here at the Kennedy School for basically everything we do. I won't talk too much about the networking because David, Mark, and Julie all talked about that as well, but obviously a really important part of coming here and some of the best learning happens um, within the cohort that you are in. Um, and you, just the expertise that comes to these programs um, just can't be replicated. Um, and then of course, after you complete a program, you are part of our alumni community. Um, and we've all talked today about some of the um, kind of offline work that happens within cohorts for years after the program ends. Um, you're also within the larger Kennedy School alumni community. Um, and that includes invitations to alumni events around the world, hosted by HKS Alumni Relations and our regional alum alumni associations. You have access to our alumni newsletter and forums um, and things like uh, access to our office that um, can provide you with Harvard Kennedy School interns. Um, so lots of great benefit there. We wanna go to the next slide. Um, another thing that's really important that we wanted to highlight is our executive certificate. Um, this is a credential available to um, participants who complete three uh, programs within six years. Um, there are four different tracks for our executive certificate and programs sit in different tracks and you should definitely go to our website that's here on the slide to learn more information. Um, but we have a public leadership track, public policy, economic development, and nonprofit leadership. And again, completing three programs within each of those tracks 
um, will earn you that executive certificate, which is just another level of credentialing um, from the Kennedy School and a great opportunity um, to go deep into some of these programs. So you may wanna do senior executives in state and local government with us uh, in the summertime um, and get very lit up about evaluation and come back and do Julie's program later in the year. Um, so it's a great opportunity to get a lot of content and go really deep in some of our offerings. Um, so I think that's all I'm gonna say about general process. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit about how the Q&A is going to work. Um, and my colleague, Erica Lane is here to help us moderate the Q&A. So quick reminder, um, please submit your questions via the Q&A function. I know there's been some coming in as we've been talking. Please note that we're gonna focus our questions on general topics related to executive education or any of the programs we highlighted today. We are not able to address questions about individual applications or admissibility. If you have a specific question about a program, you may contact the program director identified in the slides, which as I said, will be shared after the webcast. And then on our website, as I said earlier, all of the programs have a contact information uh, for a program director, and you should feel free to reach out directly with specific questions. So I will now turn it over to Erica uh, to get us started on the Q&A. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, David. Thanks, Julie and Mark. Um, we have a couple of questions um, that I am going to kind of uh, pull together around uh, admission profile. So Mark talked a little bit about who the right person for that program is, um, but we're getting some questions about US-based versus international um, seniority levels. So um, I'm gonna ask each of you to talk a little bit about kind of the, the profile you're looking for in your program. So David, we'll start with you. I think of the three programs, um, my program, the Senior Leaders in State and Local Government is the most US focused. Uh, we typically have a handful of participants from other countries, uh, but that's usually through partnerships, long-term uh, partnerships with those countries. And they, they come in largely to give sort of a foil and a different perspective. But most of the work that we're working on is very much US focused. Um, and we have tremendous variability, of course, across the states. And uh, we try and exploit that variability and understand how some states are ruled in one way and others are other, other way, why some counties are very powerful and others are not. Um, so we are not really international, although we love the flavor and uh, we always have a handful. But again, it's largely as a foil or as a point of reference. Thanks, David. Julie? Yes, um, the Using Evidence program is very international. And one of the things that we've discovered running the program online is that we think there's a real opportunity for some of you to think about sending two or perhaps three people from your organization to an online program so that you can begin to change the culture within your organization around using evidence, getting people to understand, gosh, if we count things, if we try it a different way and see how it works, did we, can we perform better? How would we know? Um, so we have people from small organizations, we have people from national governments, uh, from around the world. We have people from state and local governments, people from the United Nations, the World Bank, um, but also we have had uh, United Way of Canada has sent several people from different parts of Canada to be part of a group. So um, it's, it's broad, both internationally, it's broad in terms of organization type, large, small, nonprofit, uh, governmental. Occasionally we get a for-profit person, but normally that's a for-profit organization that runs a foundation or something else and is trying to figure out uh, how to be more effective. Thank you. And Mark, um, you did a great job outlining it. If we could talk a little bit about international versus U.S.-based um, and any other sort of uh, profile you're looking for. Absolutely. Uh, 
here, international is a great asset to everyone who participates. The issue of service delivery is one that is faced around the globe. Everyone has to do it. And what I've observed is that there are, are some great ideas here in, in the US, but there are some absolutely fabulous ideas that you can find around the globe. And so I'm hoping for a relatively even balance perhaps between international and domestic, because I think the value that that will create just in terms of idea generation uh, will be really a value for everyone who participates. Great, thanks everyone. And um, we have a couple of questions about the sort of time commitment for both online and on campus programs. So Taylor, I'm gonna ask you to, to take that question. Sure. Um, and just to maybe give a general arc to what David, Julie, and um, Mark just said, in terms of uh, qualifications um, across our program, we're typically looking for senior leaders, um, and that's 10 plus years of um, public service, typically. Um, and just to, again, put a point on what the, everyone else said, um, our cohorts are often, of course, largely government um, folks, but we do have people from nonprofits, occasionally from the private sector, um, multilateral organizations, and the like. So all um, just to kind of give a sense of that. And then in terms of timing, it really depends on the program itself, but you should expect to be in live program sessions um, for all of these programs, which are um, synchronous programs um, for you know, up to three hours a day on Zoom um, for our online programs. And those are mandatory. Um, and as I said earlier, um, a big part of our pedagogy is this highly interactive experience. And so we really expect participants to be live in the Zoom, um, fully present, having done readings, um, ready to reflect on cases um, and to jump in and offer their expertise and their reflection on the, any of the pre-work um, that is required for the, for the program. Um, there is always pre-work. Um, <laughs> typically we offer that um, about two weeks in advance of the start of the program. And that'll be a mix of um, readings, case studies. Often there are videos to watch. Um, and each session will have a mix of that that you will be expected to complete before you come to the program. Um, everybody has touched on small group work. Um, often you will be asked to come with a project that you wanna work on, um, that you will be throughout the program uh, applying your learnings in real time to those projects and often will have some sort of deliverable at the end of the program. You know, I just want to add one thing about the, the, the versions of state and locals. We have the online program, which is two weeks, and we have a three-week in-person program. And I noticed in the participants, we have several of our alumni, and, I, and one name just popped out, and that's Lori Bush. And I remember, Lori, when you were in the program, it is, and it's the case for our in-person programming, intense. I mean, we expect it to be uh, kind of all-consuming for certainly the first two weeks, and then you get a little bit of a break, and then we get you for the third week. So whatever we need to do to try and deliver the product in a way that's going to stick is what we'll do. And online, we have Zoom fatigue and different ways of trying to engage people, and we understand what the arc looks like for a 90-minute segment or a 25-minute segment. In person, it's the same kind of concern. What do we need to do to get people's bodies moving and their heads working in a direction that'll make a lasting change? Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about uh, general fit, um, in, including a question from someone who's asking about um, uh, local government executive branch versus legislative branch. So. Um, could you talk a little bit, I know David uh, in particular, uh, about legislators in the program versus the sort of administrative team? Uh, Kindly we, talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll try and do it briefly. So uh, as you know, most of the training that people are getting in local government and state government uh, is fairly stovepipe. So you have the first responders meeting with their own folks. You don't even have police talking to fire, right? Much less city managers 
in an open and honest way, sitting down with elected officials locally or statewide, because most of that training is stovepipe. We try to do both executive branch and legislative branch, um, and we're creating that ecosystem for you. So you're going to get to know a state senator and what her deep background is, what are the values that she brings to the table, and how does she view a program or a problem. And then you'll hear from uh, the first responders, how they think about budgeting. In the building of our ecosystem, we try and really make it full and robust. So if you are a first responder and applying to the program, it's difficult to get in to this program because we have many applicants. I want to put out a call for people who may not have uh, thought that we would be really enthusiastic about adding you to the program, librarians, social service, uh, local social service providers, statewide social service providers, um, children rights organizations, um, community foundations. You're all important parts of what it may, takes to make a city, a county, and a state work. And that means you're an important part of this program, elected, appointed, we want you. And if I could add something, we want you talking to one another. And sometimes it's hard within your own municipality or state to do that. But when you're talking across states, across cities, across countries, you can begin to start that conversation, learn one another's jargon and private language and, uh, and develop those skills as well. Thanks so much. Um, we had a, a comment slash question here. Um, I'm going to turn to Taylor. Um, you know, obviously we've pivoted fully online um, in the past year and few months. Um, and uh, just a question in terms of the online programs versus the on campus, will there continue to be a mix once we are hopefully post pandemic? Um, so Taylor, can you talk a little bit about the sort of general program uh, content going forward? The, sort of online versus yeah, on campus. Of course, so we are of course right now fully online um, and we have a robust portfolio of online programs. It's um, staggering <laughs> to see how much that uh, we've been able to offer in the past year. And I think what we've learned in the past year is the Zoom pedagogy works extremely well. Um, I, I saw some comments in the Q&A about the accessibility of online programs. Um, and I think another thing that we've learned that's been so powerful is, you know, not everyone can come to Cambridge for a week or three weeks, um, but we can deliver the same learning experience online uh, without having to drag you onto an airplane. Um, and that's been a great benefit. So um, our, our expectation is that we will continue online uh, in perpetuity, um, that we will always have these offerings uh, for folks who prefer online learning. Um, and that when, when we come back to campus, um, we will go back <laughs> to our in-person programming, um, but we'll always offer both online and in-person. And I think one thing I've been underscoring with my online cohorts lately is, um, a great opportunity with the executive certificate is to do a couple programs online and then maybe come to campus for your final program or right. do it in some sort of mix. Um, so another great opportunity with that executive certificate is not only a breadth of programs, uh, but a breadth of delivery options um, moving forward. And just a follow on question that we got about the online programs versus the on campus, particularly those that pivoted, um, how closely does the curriculum follow along? And I know it's a little different for each, but um, Julie, you had the experience of pivoting or first early on. So <laughs> maybe did. you can talk about kind of how you thought about moving the curriculum. Along. Yes, um, it does contain the same curriculum in the using evidence course. And we have some asynchronous material for you to watch first and we discuss it in class. But we discovered the first, we were the first program to go online and we discovered right away a real benefit of online programming as opposed to on-campus programming. We had several students in that first class who had been to executive ed programs on campus. 
And they all said they really liked the early morning or late afternoon study groups that were organized around people in their same time zone. So people in Australia and sort of that side of the Pacific were all working together across country boundaries. The Middle Eastern folks and the Europeans were working together. Um, but they loved the random random breakouts into small study groups in the middle of a class presentation. In the past, we used to say, talk to the two or three people around you. Now with Zoom, we can mix people up randomly. And to a person, they said, we, I made contacts with people from around the world that I would never have made contacts with in the past. We discovered we had a lot in common as we were discussing these cases and then coming out for the class session. So I just wanna emphasize, yes, there are some advantages of the Harvard experience and being on campus, but there are some real advantages of doing executive education online and cost savings may not be the primary one, although it's important. Yeah, may I add on to um, what Julie said, because we've learned so much in the last year and a half, haven't we, Julie, or I guess just oh, over a yeah. year. And um, as Julie and I anticipate this fall teaching in person in our degree program courses, um, I, I, I'm certain that it, the experience of being online will change how we teach in person as well. Um, I will do more flipped classrooms. I'm going to bring simulations a little more actively in. There'll be more asynchronous and so forth. Um, and that'll all spill over into the in-person executive ed programs when you come to campus. So um, we don't, in the state and local program, want to ever lose that intense feeling and having Marty Linsky talking directly to you and getting to your soul, which has to happen in person. But there's a lot that we can do um, and a lot of better teaching, I think, that we can do as a result of having survived and learned how to teach online. So it won't be the same. It's going to be better. And we're going to be in person and we're going to be online. If I could just add one thing to that, we developed, for example, a lot of asynchronous material and various types of experimental design. This means if you've studied this in the past, you can watch it once and get a refresher, but if this is all news to you, new to you, you can watch it over and over and until you really fully understand it, coming to class prepared, rather than having us go through it in class. So yes, we've learned, we're not too old to learn new tricks. We haven't been doing it for too long to learn new tricks. This is a productive year in many ways. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the, the Q&A around the evaluation of the programs. Um, how do you evaluate the courses and decide what to keep in and what to keep out um, from year to year? Um, Taylor, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit in general about what happens and then if anyone has any additional comments on how they've used the feedback and the evaluations, that would be great. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about our general process. Um, and maybe David can give the other side of the coin and how we uh, you take those evaluations every year. So um, every program is evaluated rigorously. Um, one of the things, if you've done programs with me before, I know they're state and local alum uh, for sure in the Q&A, uh, you will hear from me a hundred times during the program to please complete your evaluation. We take it very seriously. Um, so at the beginning of uh, my programs, um, we send a link to a Qualtrics survey to every participant. Um, and we, I always ask participants to make notes in real time um, because we throw a lot of content at people and it's a little bit drinking from a fire hose. Um, and we want your feedback at a pretty granular level um, that we use then to modify programs moving forward. So we ask for uh, feedback on every single session. Um, we ask for overall feedback. We ask for feedback on our, uh, our Zoom experience, uh, our supporting uh, resources, our Canvas page, which is where we share curriculum. We ask for feedback on everything. Um, and then we, we take it quite seriously in how we 
um, move the program forward for future sessions. Um, so that's kind of the general architecture. Um, I don't know if any of you want to talk about how you think about receiving those evaluations on the other end. Well, as faculty chairs, we read the evaluations for everybody in the program. So any of the and any of the faculty who are going to be teaching in the program, we go word by word through those evaluations. So people are you know, scored on a one to five on a bunch of different dimensions. And then we ask for comments and many, many applicants give many, many comments, which we try and process as deeply as we can. Um, and then there's a process of feedback with the uh, faculty. Uh, it is not the case, though, that we want everybody getting straight fives uh, because I want to create an environment in which some people are going to be uncomfortable sometimes. Or maybe there are topics that people just don't really want to talk about, right? We certainly talk about race and gender a lot, and some people thrive in that environment. Other people say, gosh, I can't believe, what are, what are we talking about that again for? So, you know, these things are, we want to create an environment in which there's um, enough tension in the room, enough tension in the space where we can have productive conversations. Um, one quick comment to Julie, because her, her programming, she described how they, they learned so quickly and they sort of changed what they were doing and people can then take it over and over again until they're ready to go to the classroom. I think that's a great example of the kind of work that they do in Julie's program. Um, you learn to experiment, get data right back right away, make necessary changes and sort of quickly repeat and, um, and build how you're delivering services. And she just models it very effectively in her class. And we take your comments from evaluations very, very seriously, which is why it's important to tell us not just what didn't work, but also what did work. So we know what to keep and uh, don't inadvertently take out things that were really effective for you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we will close the Q&A questions uh, portion now. Uh, we did get a lot of questions regarding specific admissions, application dates, um, tuition rates. I just put the website for the, our um, executive education website in the chat. You can visit there to get all of the information you're looking for for program specific information. Um, but I want to thank you all again for your great work and turn it back to Taylor. Great. Thank you so much, Erica. And thank you everyone for the great questions. Um, thank you so much, David, Julie, and Mark. That Thank you for everyone who joined us today.